Um, well, thank you um, very much for the um, kind introduction, and also thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you in particular. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk to you about the Antarctic, although I must confess my thoughts are also turning to Skyfall. Uh, which is next month, so get quite excited about that. Uh, but I don't want to sound like a James Bond groupie, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the Antarctic. Um, it's essentially, what I want to try and do is give you a sense of the, the place itself, but also why there are actually quite a few futures uh, facing the Antarctic. And some of them you might actually think of as really quite undesirable. Uh, some of them might actually be quite hopeful. Um, but I'm also not going to uh, accept it's done. The, the sort of challenges, the profound challenges facing uh, this continent and surrounding ocean that is no longer uh, remote in any sense. And one of the kind of uh, sort of causes of concern that I have when I think about the Antarctic is that on the eve of the breaking news story that Ranulph Foods is going to uh, walk across the Antarctic. Uh, why you might do that uh, is an interesting question in itself. Uh, my worry about a story such as this is that actually it skews the kind of public understanding of the Antarctic, which in a sense is, is kind of reproducing a set, a, a, an understanding of this place uh, constantly uh, mirrored or amplified by reference to past explorers. And it's a thing that I find the most frustrating when I'm asked to speak about the Antarctic. Uh, so often people say, tell us something about Scott or Shackleton, or as I'm in Ireland, Tom Green, for example, the great Irishman who accompanied Shackleton on uh, his uh, ultimate expedition. I don't really want to do that. I'm actually not interested in the heroic era. It's almost a heresy to say that if you work on the Antarctic. I don't care about Scott Shackleton, any of that lot. Um, I do care about them if, for example, we have a conversation about why certain countries think that they have some almost God given right to have a disproportionate say on how the Antarctic, both present and future, might be thought of. So, for example, one of the things that makes me very unpopular back in the UK is, is when I say, I don't think Britain should have one of the most powerful sayings on how the Antarctic is governed and managed. This is an unpopular thought, because one of the things that's going to shape the future of the Antarctic is the growing role of countries like China, India, South Korea. So one of the things I'm going to, going to reflect on in a minute is that the future of the Antarctic, in this century at least, is going to be increasingly shaped by a bunch of countries, uh, particularly to be found in the Asia Pacific region, and that's going to be a very marked contrast from what we've been used to, which is the Antarctic being thought of as something that particularly European and North American countries with some outliers in South America, Australia, and New Zealand, have had a dominant say. So I think whatever happens, the future of the Antarctic is going to lie partially in Asia, and not, as I say, in North America or Europe. This matters in all kinds of ways, because one of the things that also, I think, is going to unsettle things is that Antarctica for far too long has been thought of as a kind of white space, a space in which predominantly white, European, North American men perform uh, certain kinds of themes. And that's why, for example, I find the run of theme score uh, so depressing and, and really out of place. But in order to tell you something about the future of the Antarctic, I also have to tell you about what's happened in the past and what is happening in the present. I'm not going to dwell too long on it, but I just want to, in a sense, pull out a couple of thoughts that are absolutely critical in terms of making sense of the contemporary Antarctic, let alone any kind of future manifestation. First of all, does anyone think they own the Antarctic? Now, speaking to an Irish audience, 
uh, you might say, well, of course they do. But if I was speaking to a British audience, an Argentine audience, a Chilean audience, a New Zealand audience, um, you know, a French audience, a Norwegian audience, there'd be a resounding yes. One of the, the things that we have to acknowledge quite early on is that seven countries think they own a bit of the Antarctic. So whatever the future of the Antarctic might be, we have to, in a sense, recognize that the ownership of the Antarctic is deeply disputed. And that matters because seven countries think they have a share. The United States, China, India, Russia, and the vast majority of the world's community thinks that nobody owns the Antarctic. That actually it belongs to the global community. And uniquely, in terms of the Earth's surface, there is one part of the Antarctic that nobody owns, the so-called Pacific sector. And uh, the British, many years ago, in terrific imperial style, tried to get the Americans to claim that part of the Antarctic in the 1940s, uh, but they didn't want to, partly because they were scared that the Soviet Union might actually launch a counterplay and the Antarctic become a scene of the sport. So that's the first thing. So anything, in, in terms of reflecting on the future, we need to recognize that who owns Antarctica is not an easy question to answer. The second thing is, Antarctica is full of resources. And that matters because actually we've already seen a glimpse of the future uh, in the 19th and 20th century. If, for example, I reflected just for a minute on what happened to Antarctica seals and whales, we've seen a very unappealing future uh, that transpired in places like South Georgia, that is currently considered the British overseas territory, but at the same time the Republic of Argentina thinks actually that territory belongs to it. By, for example, the 1960s, well over one million whales had been slaughtered, and millions of seals had also been killed from the 1820s onwards. So when we think about Antarctica's future, whatever that future may be, resources are always going to move large. And once we throw into this resource equation, for example, things like fish, we're talking about a space that many countries, many corporations, uh, many NGOs have worried about, and at the same time also been eager to exploit, precisely because of its perceived riches. Um, if, for example, you've seen films like Happy Feet, you'll realize that actually one of the underlying narratives in that particular film is actually about resource exploitation. And indeed, I think we have the penguin Mumble basically begging uh, humans to stop excessive fishing. Uh, so Hollywood, in its own particular uh, way, has also picked up on, I think quite rightly, one of the biggest challenges facing the Antarctic at the moment, which is unregulated fishing. So the resources is a kind of nightmarish specter that haunts uh, the Antarctic. And that doesn't even begin to get me on to the other aspect of resources, which of course are things like oil, gas, zinc, coal, iron ore, uh, you name it, it's probably there. At the moment, a lot of those resources uh, are not commercially exploitable. And indeed, as you know, in the last five or ten years, there's been far more interest in the Arctic. But the only thing I will say is, is that what happens in the Arctic, one particular cold space, has the potential to be transferred to the Antarctic in decades to come. And I can absolutely assure you, over the last 50 years, an awful lot of people have been interested in the resource potential of the Antarctic, including corporations, not just governments. The third thing that um, we should acknowledge is the role of science. Uh, science has, on the one hand, been enormously helpful in actually telling us about what might be happening to the Antarctic. And you probably see, haven't you, I'm sure, multiple stories warning us about ice cap instability, 
about the threat that might be posed to Antarctica's living uh, organisms, and for example, the undeniable warming trends in particular parts of the Antarctic, particularly the peninsula area. But science has always been double-edged, and we've just had an international polio between 2007 and 2009. And whilst on the one hand, as I say, there's been a lot of positive commentary about the role that science has played in enhancing our understanding of the Antarctic, science has also been deeply interwoven with the geopolitical. One of the reasons why, for example, Britain, Australia, Argentina, Chile, Norway, France, as well as the United States and, and Russia, invest so much in science because science is a way of registering your interest in the Antarctic. So, if, for example, I told you that the United States established a scientific station at the South Pole in 1957, there's a reason why they did so. They located their research station in the heart of Antarctica to make a very powerful point. We want to claim the whole of the Antarctic, we can do so. And the Soviet Union created a research station and so called coal of relative inaccessibility because it wanted to send a message to the Americans and others that we have the capability to create a scientific station anywhere in the Antarctic. And what did the Chinese do recently? They just created a little research station in what's called Dome A the most remote, the most inaccessible part of the Antarctic, because they wanted to send a message to the world, we can also do anything we can do. So science and geopolitics go hand in hand with one another. And that can also cause a lot of uh, unease amongst the scientists themselves, because whether they like it or not, whatever they do is contributing to a particular future that may not be a peaceful one. And that's, that's an important sort of third element in terms of thinking about the Antarctic. Um, the other thing that I'd say is that why is the Antarctic at the moment relatively peaceful? And the key factor here is the Antarctic Treaty negotiated in 1959. The treaty does a number of things. But the most important thing is that it says, we know we can't agree over resources. We know we can't agree over territorial ownership. But could we promote science as a kind of mechanism for thinking about cooperation and collaboration with one another? Now, what's happened over the last 50 years is that that treaty has had to be strengthened, has had to be improved upon because of the pressures facing the Antarctic. And one of the most notable areas, again, has been resources. So, for example, in 1991, something called the Protocol on Environmental Protection was negotiated. And what that said was, was that there would be no mining or mineral exploitation in the Antarctic. And that was considered absolutely critical to try and really diffuse growing anxiety that the Antarctic might actually be exploited. Of course, the point is it's already been exploited. But in a sense, what's, what they've been prepared to do is to tolerate resource exploitation in the Southern Ocean, but to try and, in a sense, prevent resource exploitation on the polar continent itself. This has been not straightforward in any sense, because actually what it's done is actually merely defer a question that still, as I said right at the start, is not being addressed. Who owns Antarctica? And the reason why nobody wants to address that question is because there is no simple answer. And to do so would probably destroy the treaty itself. And that's why I get frustrated when we have lots of stories about elderly white men trying to cross the Antarctica on foot. Because in a sense, to my mind, it's looking backwards as opposed to looking forwards. What has always been true of the Antarctic over the last 100 years is that it has encouraged speculation 
about what the future might hold. So, for example, in the 1940s, there was a rather quaint idea that the Antarctic could be a nuclear testing zone. You know, there was a sense in which if we were going to test nuclear weapons, what could be better than blowing them up in a place where nobody lived? Providing, of course, you took no notice of non-human living uh, organisms. Now, in the 1950s, the United States was particularly impressed with that idea. Uh, but Argentina, Chile, South Africa, and all the neighboring states were less inclined uh, to think about nuclear weapons testing in such a benign kind of way. The consequences, by the way, of saying no nuclear testing in the Antarctic, which the Antarctic Treaty secured, was that nuclear testing, of course, happened in places that were inhabited. So there was a kind of interesting trade-off here between trying to, in a sense, prevent a nuclear future in the Antarctic. It nearly got displaced to the Pacific, uh, to Alaska, to Algeria, uh, two parts of the Soviet Union, I'll mention just a few years ago. The other thing that uh, Antarctica was thought about in terms of the future was that it might be a giant food freezer. So there were kind of plans in the 50s that if there was any surplus food, uh, that it all should be transported to the Antarctic and, in a sense, stored in an apparently straightforward manner. Um, that idea was judged to be rather impractical when it was discovered how expensive it might be to actually transport the same food. It also seemed to underestimate uh, the widespread usage of refrigeration units. The other thing that the Antarctic has been thought about is a kind of space of refuge. And there's a rich tradition of thinking of the Antarctic as a place where humanity could relocate. Uh, you know, if everything else went to hell in a handbasket, and there was always this particular space. Um, given what's happened to the Antarctic in terms of melting, that may not be such a plausible alternative. But it's often loomed at large as a kind of attractive idea. Having said that, of course, the idea of Antarctica as a refuge uh, was one that had a certain kind of interest uh, in about 1945. Uh, when it was widely speculated that perhaps Adolf Hitler had not committed suicide in Berlin, but actually disappeared with some members of the Third Reich and relocated somewhere in the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, this kind of feverish speculation about Hitler and Eva Brun uh, making a new life with one another somewhere in the Antarctic Peninsula added, had a certain kind of resonance in part because the Nazis tried to claim a little bit of the Antarctic in 1938-39. There's a sort of, uh, sort of wonderful accounts of planes flying over the Antarctic and swastikas being thrown out of the window uh, to make good uh, a claim to the Antarctic. Thankfully for us, you might think, uh, Norway got in there first and claimed that particular part of the Antarctic. One of the legacies of the Second World War was that Germany and Japan had to forever renounce any possibility of making a claim to the Antarctic. That wasn't quite so fanciful as it might seem, because Japan, for example, was a very active and whaling and exploratory nation in the Antarctic. Um, so, in a sense, that's why Germany and Japan don't loom too large uh, in terms of Antarctic geopolitics. Uh, another area of speculation uh, was, was involving, again, uh, resources. And, for example, in the 1970s, it was widely thought that krill, these sort of tiny prawn-like creatures, might help uh, feed the global south. And so quite a few American demographers suggested that you know, with rising world population, what we needed to do was to exploit Antarctica's living resources, particularly the humble krill, and to feed the masses. Uh, if you've ever tried krill, I can absolutely assure you it's disgusting. Uh, and it's not really worthy of consumption. I'm delighted that uh, whales and penguins uh, enjoy krill, but I can assure you, you do not. Prawns, they are not. But again, it just tells you, I think, something about the Antarctic that it's invited this kind of speculation, this fantasy, this intrigue. There's always been somebody or someone 
who's prepared to think of a certain kind of future. And thinking about the future, I think, is, is really quite important because partly it's, about, it's an imaginative process. You know, it's, it asks us to think about what is it that we wish for in the context of the Antarctic. This is true, of course, of other areas of life. It also brings to the fore the importance of anticipation. So, for example, if there are certain things you wish to see in the Antarctic happen, what would you reasonably do, either in the present or the immediate future, to try and secure such an outcome? One of the things that Greenpeace did in the 1980s was to actually put forward a particular vision for the Antarctic. What they wanted was a world park. Their suggestion was a simple one. All forms of exploitation should either end or simply be prohibited for all time. And one of the things that Greenpeace did was they created their own research station. They harassed and harried other Antarctic parties. And they did so in the name of humanity. And they made very bold claims and said, we're acting on behalf of humanity. We think the Antarctic should not be exploited for the selfish interests of a few states or a few corporations. That actually had a tremendous impact. Um, you know, I told you earlier that there's this prohibition on mining uh, and mineral exploitation from 1991 onwards. I think that was very largely due to the Greenpeace campaign. What Greenpeace were terrifically able at was they, they just took photograph after photograph and they circulated it to various constituencies, particularly in North America and Europe, and said, look what they're doing. You know, and, and some of the images, for example, included science stations. And one of the things that used to happen in the science station, and it sounds kind of trivial, but it, it, it was very powerful, was that people used to burn rubbish, uh, and or else they'd just chuck things into the water with absolutely no sense that anything might be recycled or returned uh, somewhere else, say to North America or Europe, to be properly processed. Now those images were, were very, very powerful and they did a lot of work, not least because very, very few people, comparatively speaking, will actually go to the Antarctic. Um, you know, I mean, if you're interested, I have been four times, but I can absolutely assure you it's very expensive and it's quite time consuming. And by the way, if you get seasick, don't ever think about going to the Antarctic. Uh, first time I went, it was Force 10, Force 11. And when a ship goes up and down like that, up and down like that for two and a half days, uh, you soon discover whether you're, you have saving legs or not. Let me assure you. One passenger never left his cabin. The entire two weeks being so traumatized. So you have your uh, go at your peril, but also start saving. <laughs> so Greenpeace kind of intervened in a very particular way and said, look, we want a particular future for the Antarctic, and we are going to agitate, we're going to harass, and we're going to make you feel very guilty. And it had some impact. Now, another vision was presented by the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, a guy called Mohamed Mattia who eventually did get to the Antarctic in 2004, who said in the United Nations, we think the Antarctic belongs to all of us. And he famously said, and I hear there's gold in the South Pole, and I want my share of it. Very different kind of vision of the Antarctic. A kind of future vision which says the Antarctic is a common heritage, and if there's anything to be had from it, it belongs to all of us. And the seven states who think they own a bit of it, they can forget it. Actually, the Antarctic should be, in particular, for the benefit of the poorer countries of the world. Now, that vision was not widely shared, as you can imagine, by the major Antarctic treaty countries. If you can imagine in Britain, for example, uh, there was a kind of considerable antipathy to that particular view. I remember talking to people in the Foreign Office at the time saying, you know, what a ridiculous individual. I think what made it more ridiculous was that a former colony was actually behaving in a kind of what was seen as a rather disrespectful kind of way. So there's, you can't underestimate the enduring power of the colonial imagination. 
uh, when it comes to the Atat. In a way, that vision of common heritage was, was in a sense, put to bed when this mining prohibition came in, because actually there was nowhere to go. Uh, in a sense, the, the leaders, some of the leaders of the Global South, kind of, in a sense, had their, their argument diffused in, in, in a way that nobody was going to benefit from that kind of sense. There's another vision, of course, of the Antarctic, which may or may not appeal to you, but one that is coming and one that is intensifying. And that is a commercial future. You know, on the one hand, fishing is clearly a commercial activity. That's one thing. But actually, one of the most profound transformations affecting the Antarctic in the last 30 years has been tourism. Something like 50,000 people visit the Antarctic. That's a high point every year. The financial crisis did actually make a little bit of an impact. Probably numbers went down to 35,000. They appear to be picking up again. Now, that kind of vision, future vision of the Antarctic, definitely has complicated a kind of a future vision of the Antarctic where science predominates. One of the things that science and scientists have had to, in a sense, get used to is that the future of Antarctica is going to involve a growing commercial element. You can't underestimate, for example, the value of commercial fishing in the Southern Ocean. You know, with all the talk about fisheries being exhausted, the Southern Ocean looks a very appealing space. Uh, and just wait till that sea ice, by the way, in the high Arctic diminishes still further. That'll be another area of interest. But tourism is also making a difference. Five years ago, we had a glimpse of a potentially unwelcome future when a vessel called the Explorer sank off the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, I don't know if you remember the, the image of a white and red ship on its side. hundred odd passengers having to be rescued, and the ship disappeared under the water, and that was the end of it. Now, as it happens, the tour operators often say that when you go on these trips, you are following in the footsteps of Scott and Shackleton. So you might argue <laughs> they had a Scott slash Shackleton experience. Although, thankfully, from their point of view, it's more Shackleton than Scott. Uh, because all of them survive. But it does tell you about a certain kind of future vision of the Antarctic. If more and more people go into the Antarctic, which they are, if there is a growing tourism industry and there's a growing propensity, particularly for rich people, to do silly things, uh, you know, involving all kinds of uh, mobile objects, whether it's skydiving, over the polar plateau, skiing, kayaking, you name it, it's been done. It does raise interesting issues about how those activities are regulated, whether we think they're appropriate, whether, for example, you would be troubled by the news that Chile is very eager to set up uh, a sort of hotel. It really has a kind of residence where people could stay. But certain countries really like the idea of further institutional development and infrastructural provision because they think there are quite a few people who will pay. And one of the things that we've noticed is growing Asian interest in the tourism market in Antarctica. Uh, so not just traditionally American and Europe, which have been very strong, we now see more and more uh, basically rich Chinese and Indian tourists coming to the Antarctic. So that's another kind of future vision there. And it does raise interesting issues about how it might be regulated, whether we think it's going to be compatible with ideas of wilderness values, um, and whether, for example, we want to see more infra infrastructural provision, particularly in the relatively accessible Antarctic Peninsula region. There's another area of commercialism that's having an impact on Antarctica, and that's called biological perspective. That's when, for example, you take something from an organism and then you make that, whatever that thing might be, commercially valuable. So one of the things that um, scientists and corporations would be very interested in is, for example, how you know, these uh, certain types of fish, particularly the ice fish, have a capacity to remain frozen free. And so some of these organisms are being kind of used and transferred uh, for commercial application. 
and that's called buyer perspective, knowledge perspective. An awful lot of institutions are involved in this, not just corporations, but also universities like Oxford um, have biological perspective concerns. Why does it matter? Well, one of the things that's really dominated Antarctica has been a sense in which that if we generate scientific knowledge, we share it freely. That becomes harder if that knowledge has commercial value. You know, if it's no longer just knowledge for knowledge's sake, then what's happened is that there's a sort of reluctance, increasing reluctance, to actually share and to actually communicate with one another because of potential commercial value. So, one fear, therefore, that follows from all of this is that commercialism, or if you like, the neoliberalization of Antarctica, to put it more grandly, is going to undermine the cooperative ethos or agenda that was established 50, 60 years ago. And those are some of the kind of pressures that will, in a sense, prevail in the context of the Antarctic. But the other thing, of course, that is, is worth noting is that whatever happens, whatever we do, the Antarctic itself appears to be profoundly affected uh, by ongoing, unrelated global warming. And indeed, one of the sort of messages that I think every polar scientist I have ever met will offer you is that Antarctica is changing. Antarctica is changing uh, not only in terms of things that you might read about, but in terms of ice cap stability. But what I think really disturbs people is that there's a sense of a, a sort of gap of understanding that we still don't know why to a certain extent, and also how far Antarctica will continue to change. And so some of the most exciting research something I've encountered has been looking at, for example, subglacial lakes. And this is right, right underneath the, the ice cap itself and trying to better understand the stability, for example, of the immense East Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and one very unwelcome future will be in terms of further instability of the ice sheet, further melting, and uh, corresponding implications for sea level rise. And then couple that, if you will, with what we know is happening in places like Greenland, uh, you're actually looking at a fairly uh, disturbing scenario. So, it, it, in short, I, I think what I would like to sort of wrap up and say is that the Antarctic faces multiple futures. Uh, but the ones that I, I would particularly draw your attention to is growing interest in resources and the exploitation of resources. And I see absolutely no reason why mineral resources would not be on the agenda uh, in probably about 50 years' time. I think there's enough to be getting on with in places like the Arctic. Um, but again, everything to a certain extent will depend on long-term trends and pricing. There is, in terms of the resourcing issue, we know it is highly likely that fishing is only going to intensify its further, uh, despite all the attempts to regulate it. You should not, in any sense, uh, be reassured by attempts to promote environmental stewardship in the Antarctic. A really excellent example of how the commercial and the stewardship side of things clash with one another is happening right now. New Zealand and America cannot agree on what to do with the Ross Sea as a marine protected area. The Americans, this may seem slightly counterintuitive, but it is true, want to actually to have more resource restrictions in the Ross Sea area. And the Ross Sea, in terms of, this is where actually an image of the Antarctic might help you to orientate yourselves, but if you can imagine where New Zealand is on the world map, just go south, due south, and that's the Ross Sea. Okay. It's one of the most ecologically interesting areas in the world, and it's one of the areas that's least well understood. Now the Americans say, we really should get serious give this 
maximum protective status. You might ask, why the Americans doing that? They often have a reputation of being a little bit walking when it comes to environmental management. It's because they have no commercial interest. About 10 or 15 years ago, New Zealand developed a commercial fishery in the Ross Sea. And therein lies the tension. It's not worth a huge amount, but New Zealand fishing companies operate in the Ross Sea. So the New Zealand government, whilst on the one hand wants to always be seen as a good environmental citizen in other parts of the world, is not so keen on a really strict marine protected area for the Ross Sea. And the Americans are quite frustrated because they can't understand why they wouldn't want to do it because of this area's intense ecological interest. And that, in a sense, highlights only too nicely these kind of pressures that look, you and I would be used to in other parts of the world, but somehow we naively think everybody acts in a more altruistic kind of way because it's the Antarctic, because nobody lives there. And I think one of the things that, thinking about the Antarctic future, I want to leave you with is an absolute profound sense that we must get away from this kind of rather childish view of the Antarctic, that it's a special place because no one lives there. You know, what I think happens in the Antarctic is the Antarctic is a great place to learn what actually happens elsewhere. It's just kind of magnified. It seems more extraordinary because, in a sense, we're arguing over things that we argue everywhere else in the world. You know? uh, in, in Britain's case, think about the arguments we have about whether we should have a third runway in Heathrow. It's an argument about a commercial argument. It's an environmental argument. We can't make a decision. Well, we're not going to make a decision at least until the next election, which says it all. Um, so you've got those kind of pressures. And the other thing that I think, in terms of Antarctic future, I want to leave you with, is that we must stop thinking of science as a noble, disinterested, apolitical activity. You know, what the Antarctic reminds us is that science, geopolitics, nationalism go hand in hand uh, with one another. And, and that we mustn't have a naive view that science is all disinterested. Um, speaking to an audience such as this, I suspect you don't. But it, it always amazes me when I speak about Antarctic science, everybody thinks scientists are really virtuous individuals. They may well be, but we have to see it within this wider matrix. And the final thing I'll say is about sovereignty. Now, you know, of course, that China and Japan are having a little local difficulty with a bunch of uh, uninhabited rocky islands. And as soon as you say it like that, it sounds kind of ridiculous. Because you think, why on earth would people be arguing over some kind of uninhabited rocks in a disputed part of, uh, of the waters between those two countries? Once, of course, one appreciates that even little rocks can generate extraordinary maritime resource interests, as well as having strategic significance, you no longer see them in quite the same kind of trivialized sort of way. And one of the things that I, in a sense, I should tell you about is that sovereignty really, really matters in the Antarctic. And countries like Australia spend millions of Australian dollars every year trying to consolidate their sovereignty. And again, if you can imagine an Antarctic map, Australia claims two-thirds of the Antarctic as its own. So it's a massive space. And they really think that it, there is something called Australian Antarctic Territory. Now, as I said before, tragically, for Australia to this, Russia, China, and others think that's rather fanciful and don't take it very seriously. But that doesn't stop the Australians waving flags, producing maps, creating research stations, sending warships to that part of the world to say, it belongs to us. Now that doesn't mean other countries take it seriously, but it just reminds us that whatever future Antarctica may or may not enjoy, the power of sovereignty cannot be underestimated. And the allure of territory you also underemphasize at your peril. So all this nonsensical talk about globalization, eroding boundaries and all the rest of it, complete nonsense. Now, whether you're talking about this country or the UK, about the politics of immigration is one thing, 
You go to the Antarctic, where apparently no one lives, and it turns out the indigenous human population, one should think for one second that people don't care deeply about those lines on the so, ladies and gentlemen, I, in a sense, want you to be a thoroughly pessimistic note. Uh, please don't be optimistic about the future of the Antarctic. I'm certainly not. Um, I'll stop there.